Seahawks fans, wherever you may be, welcome back for another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. Join your host, Bill Alvstead, and co-host, sports writer and football analyst, Keith Myers, as we talk Seahawks football. Seahawks fans, welcome back to another edition of the Seahawks Playbook Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Alvstead, here with co-host, Keith Myers. We got an early morning recording session going on right now, Keith, and I haven't had enough coffee, so help me out. Get me... Get me going. Wait, you want do you want the the not morning person to help the morning person get going? <laughs> that seems that seems backwards, man. Uh, I did sound kind of energetic for not having any coffee. You yet. sounded really energetic. That was a great yeah. open. I, maybe we should start over. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We're here to talk 2020 breakout players on the defensive side of the ball. Last week was the offense. Not a huge number of surprises, although I thought Penny was kind of a a little bit of a surprise there just because he's going to start probably on the pup list, but you thought he could overcome that. Uh, This week, we're going to see if we have anything else uh, up our sleeve that might uh, surprise us a little bit. And then at the end of the show, towards the end of the show, we're going to break out a couple of rookies as well that we think could have an impact on the roster in 2020. Um, But before we get started with that, a couple of news items, uh, noteworthy items out there. Patrick Mahomes, Kansas City Chiefs, agreed uh, to get paid a lot of money, Keith. $450 million over 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. Sign that's, me up. That's crazy. Um, and $45 million a year. Um like as an average. Now, what that does is that what they've done there is they've assumed that that is a uh the the, the cap's going to keep going up and all of that so they've um they've structured it so that way it goes up by a little bit every year um to get, you know, Yeah, I've end. got the exact numbers here. So it's oh, 5.3 3 million in 2020, 5.3 million cap hit in 2020, which is perfect for them Mm -hmm. 24.8 in 2021 31.4 in 2022 and then it's 40 to 50 million dollars after that guarantees go away all the guaranteed money 53 million up front well not up front in the first three years of the deal so this basically allows that structure allows the chiefs to be competitive from a roster standpoint for the foreseeable future for at least the next three years if Mm -hmm. not longer because they can they can also, the contract is structured in a way where they can add uh, more um, bonus money, take away some of the base money of the contract, and just kind of push this thing forward for basically as long as they, they want. So they could, in theory, um, stay cap relevant with this deal for the next five years. Yeah, And that's absolutely. scary for the other AFC uh, teams, for sure. Now, they, they do stay cap relevant for the next you know five years, maybe six um, but what that does though, is it does, if they continue to push, you know, it down the road a little bit, um, after, after that five years, then it gets really ugly because, well, there's no guarantees. So they do have the upper hand as far as, um, strategy in order to, um, to, to make Mayhomes uh, kind of <sighs> want to restructure yeah. Um, because he would want those guarantees. As you get older as a player, you become more susceptible to injury, the kind of player that he is. While he's dynamic right now, five, six years down the road, maybe he slows down a step a little bit. So you want to try to have guarantees in your deal. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, if you really take a look at the deal as well, for from a Kansas City team perspective, with the projected cap growth over the next decade or so, the way that it's been going, let's just say it kind of goes that way. You've got a new CBA that adds some more cap as well. The contract still only represents 15 to 16% of overall team cap hit, which is very similar to the deal that Russell Wilson struck. So let me ask you this. What does this do um, to player team quarterback contracts in the future? I mean, this thing's kind of, I mean, it's just way out there. Like, there's no other contracts that are beyond five years for 
uh, quarterbacks in the NFL or any other position or for that matter. And there's a reason for that. The reason for the, the, the fact that deals tend to stop at five years is that's as far out as you can go and push salary cap. Uh, or yeah, salary cap hits for bonus money. Um, so whatever his bonus money comes in for it in this for a signing bonus, it only counts over the first five years, and then after that, um, it comes off. You know, it comes off the books that way. And so the, that's the reason why teams do five year deals is because at the maximum because that gives them the most cap relief for the signing bonus, and then the years after that don't help. And so, uh, so do the years after five years in this deal actually just real really count because the team has zero liability at that point? No, they. I, th- this is. I mean, because is this a show contract? It's kind of a show contract because there's no guaranteed money and all of the dead money on the deal. Um, unless they do a bunch of restructures along the way, or or it's set up to do other bonuses. Uh, like bonus money so that it phases in that way um, after five years. But, it, but, but subtly though, the team still has team control over Patrick Mahomes for 10 years. That's the part that it works. Is that would they I, have, would I, that's why I don't understand why Mahomes signed this deal. He signed the deal because of $450 million. That makes him, that's the richest contract in American sports history by yeah. I was going to say like Alex Rodriguez and the the Yankees at two hundred and sixty million or two hundred eighty five million or whatever that was over ten years. That blew me away. This thing is just on another level. Exactly, and so he's getting a ton of money, and he's guaranteed. It's guaranteed for injury up to a hundred and forty million dollars. Yeah, that's so, just absolutely. Crazy! Talk about hamstringing your franchise. We saw what that did to the Seahawks with Chancellor with mm-hmm. a tenth of that amount. Yeah, and so with with Cam, you know that neck injury forced him into retirement. He didn't want to stop playing. He had to. Um, and you know if that happens to Mahomes uh, this next season, then they basically have to hold him on the roster for two or three years because they can't take that 140 million of injury yeah. guarantee in one year because that's their entire cap. You know, I don't think it's not, but it's, they would have to cut pretty much everyone and be an expansion team sure. to take a, a cap hit of 140 million in one year. So they're, they're even going spreading to be, 140 million over three years is astronomically difficult. Yeah. And so it's one of the things they're going to, ha- they were, they're going to have to hold. So that right there is part of the reason why he took it is because he knows no matter what, that is a ton of money. Um, and yeah. Good on Patrick Mahomes. I mean, congratulations to the player. You know, the thing about Patrick Mahomes, dude, is if you really look at his career, he's ha- only had 36 starts or 35 or whatever it is. And he hasn't really had a bad game yet. He hasn't. Uh, he has a QBR rating of over 50 in every single one of those games. Mm-hmm. Russell Wilson has uh, a QBR rating over 50 in only three games, uh, three straight games so far uh, in his current streak. Um, the leader in that is um, oh, the, the, the quarterback from uh, <laughs> the Lions. Sorry. Um, Stafford. You know who I'm talking about? Yeah. It's Matthew Stafford has nine. And then Mahomes has 36. Um, so he's, you know, he's just on another level. He's a great quarterback, young kid, fun to watch. Oh, he's fun. really fun. And he's in a perfect offense for him. So, I mean, as far as the marriage of Kansas City and uh, Mahomes, man, it's is nearly as perfect as you can get. And that explains why they were they came together so quickly uh, to do this deal. Mm-hmm. I mean... And they locked him. They locked him down, which is which is what a franchise wants to do. So, um, okay. So let me ask you oh, one more question. We'll wrap this up. Uh, Russell Wilson. How does uh, Russell Wilson was the richest player in the NFL before this contract? Not anymore. How does this affect uh, quarterback contracts going into the future? Do you think, especially as it relates to a player of Wilson's stature? I don't know that it does because this it's is so out <clears throat> there. It's it's so out there, and it's such a unique situation for him to be that young, 
because he came into the league at like 20 or 21. So he's only like 23 now. Yeah, this is his first payday, payday uh-huh. contract. Um, and so he's really, really young. He's coming off a Super Bowl win and an MVP. And um, it's such a unique situation that a 10 year um, a 10 year contract doesn't even get him to the end of the end of his career. He could still like play the entire contract out and get another giant payday. Cause he'll be yeah, another five year contract. Yeah, yeah. Cause he'll be 33. And so it, it, it's such a unique situation. I don't think it affects anything. Um, what's going, what's going to cause, uh, the market to shift is going to be, um, see, you know, you lost a name earlier and I'm going to lose one now. Um, from, Houston. Lamar Jackson? Oh, okay. Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson. Um, Because his contract is coming up, and he is going to have an opportunity to set the bar for what contracts are going to look like going forward, because no one else is going to get a 10-year deal. In the same way that nobody else got the fully guaranteed contract that um, Kirk Cousins got. Uh, And so... uh, yeah, so you're you're gonna see uh, you're gonna see deals go up because people are gonna look at that forty five million AYP and they're gonna point at it and go, I want that. Uh, but I don't think you're gonna get ten year deals and you're gonna get going to get like these kind of crazy uh, contracts. But you are gonna are, see. Are we ever forward. gonna see anything? Are we gonna see things tied to the cap? As I, far as percentage, I think that might actually be uh, in the future. Now, Mahomes' deal did not. I was surprised actually, but it ends up being essentially uh, increases over time. Well, gives him uh, it basically pays him out fifteen to sixteen million of the percentage team cap, Mm -hmm. which is pretty much the going rate for a premium quarterback. Yeah, and that's but that that assumes that the cap continues to go up at the same rate that it has been. Correct, and that. COVID-19 doesn't... Yeah, that was that was the interesting twist to this contract is when they actually did it, which is in a year where he may not even play a down. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, you know, whatever. Okay, the next one was Clowney. So Clowney made the news just a little bit this week in the fact that the Raiders are the latest team to enter the Clowney sweepstakes, if you want to call them sweepstakes, the Clowney deal. Um, he, apparently, they made a low offer. Don't know exactly what the numbers are there. I would imagine that number is somewhere in the 9 to $12 million range, um, given the fact that every other team is kind of on record as being slightly above that, uh, including the Seahawks. Uh, the Browns today, though, another team that are kind of in the mix, uh, restructured Oliver Vernon's contract, their defensive end, that pays him $11 million in 2020 now, and also threw a no-franchise tag clause into that deal, which allows him to become a free agent after 2020. So, But that, that essentially took up a lot of their cap this season, um, and there's word out on the street that that took them out of the clowny deal now that helps the seahawks in that there's one less team now out there the titans are the other team uh, mm-hmm. according to rumor uh, but we don't know if they've offered him a contract or not yeah i mean the titans have been the other team that's been sitting there with the seahawks uh from the beginning and you know it was thought that uh that they were would at some point come in and just be like okay well, let's get this done and give him closer to what he wanted or at least, you know, a bigger number. And that, and that would be uh, possibly how this ended. Um, but they haven't, they haven't come in um, and, and made that play. They're very content to wait this out. And uh, which is interesting. And so now you get the Raiders involved with a low ball offer. Now, uh, interestingly, like, okay, uh, this is my thing, right? Um, when, Whenever these leaks come out, who benefits by it? So and, and who who leaked it? Who benefits by it? And it's pretty easy to look at this one and go, well, does Clowney benefit by it? Maybe because they're going, hey, look, there's another team interested. Seattle, yeah, he's in the news. That's it, though. Otherwise, um, it benefits Seattle the most. But does it benefit? Um, does it benefit him knowing that it was a low ball offer? I don't think so. No. 
And does it really benefit the Raiders that it was a low ball offer for a guy like that? Maybe because it gets them in the news and it's like, Hey, we're not done. We're still like uh, we're trying, trying to add, but, <laughs> right. but they're trying to add a great player by insulting him with a low ball contract. So yeah. Who's the, who's the, the GM guy at, uh, at the Raiders? Um, pa- uh, Mayock. Mayock. Mayock leaked this, right? Because, this would benefit Mayock. Um, you're trying to to go after a big name in Clowney, and you're you're giving him the lowest contract that you could possibly put out there without insulting him, and thereby, if he does sign, you're a hero, and so that would benefit Mayock the most. That yeah. would be my theory. No, and I think it's a good theory. I think um, usually what I would that would say to me because when you're putting out a low ball offer like that, you're not expecting to sign them, so. <clears throat> what this going, what this I think was was like, hey, you know, we just offered, let's say, ten million of our cap room to this guy. If he takes it, our cap room's gone. So this other person that we're in the process of renegotiating with, Derek Carr, um, yes, right? You know, if you want a deal done, you need to do it now before our cap room's gone. Yeah, there you go. I love that insight. That's right. That's awesome. All right, so let's put that to bed. We don't know what's going to happen with Clowney. It seems like the Seahawks have essentially moved on from the situation, although if he were to become available at a, at a lower number or whatever, they may decide to get back into that game and pull the trigger. And uh, I wouldn't complain. I mean, he's a good player. He'd be a great one-year addition to this current roster. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to talk about the current roster right now uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Breakout players. And the way that we did this last week is we both brought our own independent lists, as we usually almost always do. And uh, we'll just talk about players and why we thought that they would be breakout guys. And we kind of do this in reverse order, five, four, three, two, one. One being the guy that we think is has the largest upside and potential to break out. So why don't you go first, Keith? Um, okay, so if we're going to go first, um, <laughs> I'm going to save my... Number five, because it's just like last week where I saved my number five to the end because it was like the the big surprise. Uh, um, I'm going to do that now again. Now you throw our entire list off. I love true, it. True. Well, but I have I have others. <laughs> um, so I'm going to like, this. okay, I will say that this one was, it was easier to pick out the, like who it was going to be because on defense, you kind of know who the starters are and they play a lot. There's not a lot of rotation that goes on except for on the, on the uh, defensive line. And, you know, we know that there's rookies that are going to be a, a big part of all of this. So it, it, to me, it was pretty easy to, to narrow it down to uh, five or six guys. And then an order was the more challenging one. Yeah, um, no, I agree. And so, uh, I'm going to start, you know, at, at the bottom of my list with um, uh, LJ Collier. Uh, defensive end was a rookie last year, played in 11 games, had um, three tackles. Yeah, bleak. That's it. Um, really, I mean, he was hurt all all through uh, training camp and <clears throat> the first part of the year. Uh, struggled to get on the field, was a healthy scratch for a few games, finally started, you know, getting some, you know, decent snaps down the stretch, but even with that did not make an impact. Um, really just lacked, because he he lacks a lot of quickness. He's entirely a strength bull rush power guy. And without the quickness, um, you know, he needed things to break right for him to, to really have an impact, and he didn't. Um, so he was good at uh, holding, you know, an edge and, you know, doing those sort of things. But any uh, any chance to get in and, and pressure the quarterback uh, just kind of disappeared. He was just overwhelmed a little bit uh, last year. But that's that's what makes it so shocking to me in retrospect uh, that we picked him in the first round, uh, given everything that you just said, which is absolutely true. I mean, his playing strength is negated by his slow reaction time Mm -hmm. and his general tightness and lack of flexibility. And he just looks like a miscast player out there. Now I'm not saying he can come into his own 
uh, without question, that's why he's on the list. He's my number three guy on my list. Um, and, and the reason for that is, A, he's a number one former pick. He play, plays a position where he probably could get a lot of reps. And there's, an, there's a big, huge chance that he could develop and kind of break out. And mm-hmm. so um, three tackles on 152 snaps, though, 14% of the overall snaps available on the defense in 11 games. But he had zero snaps in the playoffs, non effective out there at all. Um, you know, he's a very hard worker, and that's never been really a question with him, but it just didn't translate, you know, in 2019. Yeah, and I think it's go. I, I think it has a better chance to. Let's put it that way. He he is going to be used a little bit differently. Um, it, this year he's going to get a chance to set the edge again on on running downs because that's his play strength is always going to be against the run at at the five tech. But they're going to move him inside uh, to the three tech, which really they wanted to do last year, but because he had never done that. Uh, at college or whatever, it's it's a different game on the inside where you're fighting against guards and centers than on the outside where you're playing angles and stuff with um, yeah with tackles and so having never been given an opportunity to practice, go through reps, you know, actually do it during a preseason, any of that kind of stuff, and develop those skills, they didn't really do much of that. Um, and he's going to be given the opportunity to finally put that part of his game together and, and have an impact there. And I actually think that's, that's a good fit for him to come into the inside. He's a little undersized um, at a three tech, but he's oversized as a five tech. So he's kind of in between, but his, his game uh, translates pretty well to a three tech um, position, you know, and his ability to just, especially, or maybe even, um, slide into the to the nose tackle on obvious passing situations because if they can pair with Jerron Reed and that would be a, actually a really decent situation for the Seahawks. Yeah, because imagine him on a center one on one, right? His Just ability. Imagine to, him on Joey Hunt. Well, and that and that that is actually exactly what I was thinking of because you put him uh, on an undersized center, one that's you know. Uh, there for other right. other purposes, and he's gonna just he's Bull just gonna Russia. drive them back into the quarterback's lap, um, and and that's a you that's a way to use his talents in a in a way that I will agree, help the Keith. team and everything. So I, I I see them moving him around more, getting him more involved, and having him having a chance to have um, an an impact because last year he had no impact. Yeah, I agree with you on almost every point. I'm going to slightly disagree in the fact that um, I do think he's somewhat miscast at the five tech. I think that position at this point in the league requires you to be a little bit more athletic than he is. Um, you just have to be able to be able to get to the outside, and I'm not sure that he can do it on a regular basis. Um, but we'll see. I think you're right, though, that they move him into the three tech, and I think that's where he gets almost every snap that he has in the defense this year. I, I just, with Rasheem Green out there at the five tech, and then you've got um, a guy like uh, Bruce Irvin to come up on passing downs mm-hmm. on, on that side and have Green slide in as well. I just see Collier honestly being a rotation guy with a little bit more upside than that. So if he, if he comes in and, and has a rotation role and excels at that, I see him getting more reps. Um, and, and from that three-tech spot, I mean, here's a guy that could come in with Jerron Reed. Jerron Reed slides over. Puna Ford comes out on passing downs. And now you've got three legit, uh, potentially penetrating uh, pocket rushers uh, on the inside. Um I just don't know that he's an outside pass rusher. No, he's um, not an outside didn't, pass rusher. Didn't see that at all. No, he, he's not an outside pass, pass rusher. Um, he is going to be at the five tech, uh, like kind of a Red Bryant type, I think, where he is, he'll set the edge. He'll be in. But what about and, like Rasheem Green? Um, like, where does he? Where does he get playing time? Well, he gets playing time in that uh, you're on the defensive line. You typically, your the p- players that play the most snaps are only getting sixty to sixty five percent of the snaps. There are plenty of snaps for other players, um, on on that. So, uh, but I but that's what I mean is for Collier's like role in terms of 
um, on-field schematics, I, I see him more as a Red Bryant type, where he's there as a run stuffer, moves, you know, and then uh, if they're going to get him snaps, he's going to get a few there, uh, especially in short, you know, third and one type of situations where they're, or goal line situations where, where the other team's going to more be more likely to run. You're, you're going you're gonna to see more Collier. Um, but he's going to be, yeah, he's going to be, um, he's not going to be the, in the base defense. He's going to be in that rotation because yep. uh, Rasheem Green's going to be the, the starter and going to get more of the snaps. And, and, and he could get more, more of the three tech snaps. I mean, Collier might be a guy just odd man out. You never know. I think mm-hmm. he's got an opportunity to get 10 to 15 snaps a game. But is that enough to really get him rolling and stuff? I, don't, I just don't know. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how that rotation works. I do think, though, that he'd be a really decent Jerron Reed wrote back up in a mm-hmm. rotation. Um, and it, it's just, it's frustrating, you know, because guys like um, Montez Sweat and Jerry Tillery, Seahawks moved back in that draft. They were off the board. I really do believe that they were probably targeting Jerry Tillery. Um, you could see it in the disappointment in their faces, you know, when their pick came up and they reached hard, badly for Collier, I believe. And, you know, Deon, cornerback DeAndre Baker, Caleb McGarry, the offensive tackle, Byron Murphy, cornerback Debo Samuel were all on the board right there and t- taken right after the Seahawks pick. Um, but I think, you know, with the Frank Clark deal uh, right before the draft, they just felt like they needed to get something, and ne- needed to get that replacement in there. <clears throat> and um, I just, I don't know. I mean, this is just one of those deals where I don't know how this is going to work out long term for the Seahawks for Collier, but he's on my list because he definitely has the potential to break out in year two, especially if he comes into camp healthy, uh, comes into camp ready to prove every, everyone wrong, which he recently did on an interview, uh, was anxious to, to get out there and show everybody that was kind of dissing him that he was, he wanted to live up to the player that uh, the Seahawks expected him to be. So, and if he does that, uh, he could definitely have an impact. Even at the five tech, Keith, there's some upside there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you don't always have to be the premier guy at the five tech position. That's not the way the defense is designed. You're almost intended most often to, like you said, hold that edge, set that edge, hold, stand to your position, not penetrate <clears throat> and allow your linebackers to come up and make plays. And, um, if he can do that, he could end up being in a nice rotation with Green. Yeah, and the thing is, like that is something the Seahawks ask their five tech to do, is to keep the linebackers clean on runs to that side, set the edge, keep the running back from getting outside, um, and then you know eat a block or two, and uh, let Bobby Wagner do his Bobby Wagner thing and come up and and uh, yeah. destroy and someone at the line Brooks. of scrimmage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So there's my number four. All right, Your I'm gonna turn. go with I'm gonna go with my number five guy. Okay. Uh, Cody Barton. Yep. Uh, Cody Barton's an, a nice little player. Uh, we moved up in the draft last year to get him at six two two forty. He ran a four point oh three short shuttle and a six point nine three cone. Those are elite numbers um, for for a linebacker. Absolutely. Four six four forty. Ran a one six one ten yard split, so he's got really nice short area quickness and agility to kind of navigate through traffic and all that kind of stuff. Just didn't see enough of it last year. Kind of miscast a little bit, but but did get some playing time, um, especially as the season went on with Kendricks uh, mm-hmm. out for different periods of time. Um, so he's athletic enough to play the Sam or the Will, but the Seahawks' future for him, I think, is probably at Sam, given the fact that they just signed uh, Jordan Brooks. Um, drafted Jordan Brooks. Um, and Jordan Brooks is probably going to be a more natural will over time until Bobby Wagner leaves and one of those two players could come in and probably play. See, that's what, what I, that. I was going to say. I, for me, I think his his long-term future is as the will linebacker. Uh, they drafted Jordan Brooks. He's going to play um, the Sam you know, this year and may, may play the will for a couple of years. Uh, but his long-term future is the next Bobby Wagner in the middle of that defense. So that's which player, open. Jordan Brooks or Barton? Jordan Brooks, and so that leaves Barton to be the, um, you know, he's going to be the Robin to Jordan Brooks as Batman and be this, mm-hmm. the little linebacker. I I really see that that where is where this uh, linebacker core core is. Yeah, because Barton's got excellent drop back and and pass coverage skills, 
you know, he's a, he's an excellent off the ball linebacker. So we'll see how mm-hmm. it goes. You know, he's a tough, aggressive player with a nonstop mortar. He's got great, you know, leadership qualities, and he he does the special teams thing. Uh, last year he had 151 defensive snaps, but he had 317 special team snaps in 2018. He became a core special teams guy, which is great. You know, for a third round pick and a linebacker that doesn't have a lot of room on the linebacker group to get playing time, you definitely want to be able to uh, utilize your skills um, in, in special teams. And he did that. He's got also some value um, backing up Bobby Wagner at the mic. Uh, Barton played middle linebacker at Utah, so he's got that experience. He can recognize uh, def- uh, offensive schemes and make play calls, all that kind of stuff. So he does have those skills, and that's a valuable uh, asset to have on your defense. So with Jordan Brooks and Barton uh, going into the future, and Bobby Wagner still playing at an t- elite top-end level, this defense is in pretty good hands at that spot. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And... Um... So the thing with with Barton is it's going to be as far as having a breakout year in 2020 it's going to be opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about the playing time. Because yeah. you've got Bobby Wagner there, um, who's still an All Pro. I mean, he was an All Pro uh, last year. You've got KJ Wright, who uh, had a bounce back year. Still, you can still see that he's lost a step and he's a little slower, but he. But he's, he's not going to give up his spot without a fight. No, and he's he's so smart, and his ability to sniff out a screen is as good as you'll see um, in the league. And, um, you know, now you've got, uh, Jordan Brooks coming in, who's going to fight for, uh, and probably be the Sam linebacker in, you know, week one. And so it's like, okay, well, well and Bruce Irvin. And yeah, Bruce Irvin's going to come in and, and he's going to play a lot of Sam linebacker, although I think he'll may play more defensive end. Mm-hmm. maybe he'll be week one, the Sam linebacker, but you're going to see Jordan Brooks phase into that role, uh, and Irvin play more end, um, as the season progresses, but where, where's the snaps for, for Barton? I know. And that's why he's number five on my list, because I think that something would need to happen in order for Barton to get legit Mm -hmm. consistent snaps. Now he's going to get some reps, but when you're talking about consistency and being able to, to be out there and make a difference, you're right. He may, this may be kind of a waiting in the wings year for him again. Mm -hmm. And, um, which is fine. Uh, I'm sure that he would want to get some playing time. I think he could help the defense with his speed and his agility mm-hmm. and, his, and, his and in, playing instincts, you mm-hmm. know. But, boy, that's why I'm saying this defense is actually has an opportunity to really be improved this year, especially in that second level uh, with the addition of our safeties and secondary help. And now you've got the linebackers that are just primo, right? Um, this group is legit probably top five uh, linebacker core in the NFL, maybe even closer to to number one. Well, yeah, this linebacking core is five players deep with legit, legit players, legit starters. They are five deep. Um, And that's unheard of. It's why you and I for, you know, most of the off season here have been talking about how it kind of looks like maybe KJ Wright's, you know, Mm-hmm. heading out the door and, and they especially could, they, with that big cap number non-guaranteed yeah and and, and so it and as unpopular a move as that be because kj is such a popular guy and he's just been such a great uh warrior for the seahawks for you know his whole entire career um just from a football standpoint and from a business like roster building uh cap you know standpoint it would make a lot of sense for them to move on from kj but they haven't. They don't seem to be wanting to. They're just going to hold on, and uh, you know. If the team wasn't so darn loyal, you could l- seriously make a um, an, a really nice argument to trade KJ Wright to a team that was linebacker weak, um, that would be willing to extend him another year to to kind of make that contract look a little bit better for them, and. Uh, Seahawks could pick up like a third, fourth round pick now, and 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 relieve themselves of that cap money mm-hmm. to sign a player like Clowney or or a, a trade, another mm-hmm. trade, or you know that would bring in an edge player or something. Um, well, you're saying like uh, they're you're like okay, if they weren't loyal to me, if they trading KJ Wright to a team that that part of the deal is that he will get extended, that he will get more money. Um, would be a loyal. You're doing move. him a service. Yeah, because he, 
that knee has been giving him trouble for years, and you can see it. He, last year, he played through it, and he you could tell he was he was better, and uh, you know he had some of that bounce back a little bit, but he was slow. And yeah, his career. Well, I mean, the team getting, is clearly. I would say his career is the end is much closer uh, yeah. to us than I think anyone. Well, and the really Seahawks recognize that because of the way they've drafted players. I mean, they've mm-hmm. got Cody Barton and Jordan Brooks. I mean, the writing is on the wall. The question is, do the Seahawks make a move to, to gain an asset out of this, or do they allow KJ Wright to play in a non guaranteed year for about nine million dollars, um, and play it out? Yeah, we'll see. We'll see, and I think what's going right. to ha- what would happen in a normal year is they'd go into, uh, they'd go into training camp and they would play that out in the preseason, and they'd get a really good look at Barton and Brooks and to know what they had, um, and other teams good would point. have to take would, would get a real good look at their linebackers and realize whoa we need help, um, and then they would make that move you know. Uh, near the end of training camp or, you know, right before the season in order to get the cap space, free up some playing time for the younger kids, but also do it in a way that's, Hey, yes, we're trading this player, but we're doing so to a team where he was going to continue to get playing time because he was his playing time was going to go down here. And they were willing to add a year to his deal and add more money and make more of it guaranteed. So this is doing the player a favor too. Um, and yeah, I think if you if you legit stop back, <clears throat> step back and ask yourself as a fan, would you be comfortable starting Bobby Wagner at middle linebacker, Jordan Brooks at the will and Bruce Irvin at the strong with Cody Barton backing up essentially all three of those positions? Would you be willing to go into the season like that? And I would say 90 percent of the people out there would would say that that was probably legit. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so then, therefore, if you can get assets in return for KJ Wright and also gain cap space to make another move, possibly to help your team. Um, gee, boy, that would be hard to not do as a GM. Yeah. And that's what happens when you end up with the incredible depth at a single position, the way the Seahawks have. They've got. They've got five players with starter uh, talent. Yeah, and, and they've only, got Bergervin there, and they've got Griffin there as well, kind of backup, sitting out there. Yeah, and those are you know <clears throat> those are backup guys uh, that you know they if you can keep one of them in order to because they both of those guys are are great on special teams. Um, that's that's right. helpful, but you're not going that's, to. That's right. um, you don't want to count on them to be a starter because that's not who they are. But they are. Um, they're a backup. They can come in. They can play a few snaps for you. Uh, Griffin especially shows some pass rush potential. Um, yeah. And so you're maybe a, making a roster uh, uh, opening for one of those guys. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, it would be, I know it would be an unpopular move because it would be very unpopular because KJ is such a loved guy and he should be. I mean, he's a, he is a ring of honor type guy uh, for the Seahawks in my opinion. Um, but, at some but we've point, seen this movie before. Yeah, at some point. We've seen the team, though. We've seen the team not make moves and allow players to play out contracts and move on without any compensation. Maybe they change it up. Yeah. I mean, th- this is really the difference between the Pete Carroll Seahawks and the Bill Belichick Patriots. Because Belichick moves on from guys and trades away really good players uh, if he can get a draft, a good draft pick back, because he knows that player is going to walk in free agency in a year, um, yeah. and is totally okay with that. Um, and but he restocks, you know, the team young with young talent because he gets uh, all these high draft picks for guys. And um, whereas the Seahawks much more loyal, and you see, well, like you know, they played out uh, Earl Thomas's contract and got nothing back for him but a comp pick and. Um, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. And it, it's right. getting, making those trades one year earlier is, it, it would be more extraordinarily ideal. difficult. It yeah, it's, it's difficult. But. You, ha- you have to be able to find that line. And I think that um, one of the reasons why the CX tend to get guys to come here is because they know that Pete Carroll's going to take care of them and they're not going to feel like a commodity. Um, the way they do in Belichick system. So that's part of it too. Yeah. So. Well, and you have KJ Wright, who is legit 
a great linebacker. Always been slightly underrated in the league, if not really very, overrated. And he, he would bring to the team an incredible amount of um, leadership and skill and uh, mentoring to a team, as well as really nice play on the field. So it could be a really good uh, move for both the player and the team, depending on how KJ Wright come, would come to the table on it. So I'm, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying that is a possibility, given the fact that the position group is so loaded. So um, you, you want to talk about KJ Wright being um, an underrated player in the league? He has only made one Pro Bowl in his career. Wow. That is really amazing, actually. Is, that's insane is what it is, because this is a guy that is, has been great uh, for Seattle. He's gonna, if he would finish, let's just say he played two more years for the Seahawks, he would finish, I think, number two overall in tackles behind Bobby Wagner. I mean, they're, he's a tackling machine as well yeah. from that position. 533 um, tackles so far in his career. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. Um, all right, so do you want me to go or do you want to go? Go ahead. So I have my number four player. Um, and and like you said uh, early on, uh, the hard part was positioning these guys in, yes. in reverse order. Uh, the list itself is probably very similar, I, I would imagine, uh, between you and I. Uh, but my number four overall player uh, to break out is Rasheem Green. Uh, third That's round, 2018 defensive end, three tech this year. Carol's talked about him sliding back and forth, just like we talked about with Collier. Rasheem Green, though, is the starter. Um, he's the clear starter. I think he separated himself uh, last year with his play, although he was in a rotation last year, I think with 51% of the overall snaps. I think there's room there mm -hmm. to add additional snaps um, to get him closer to that 75% range um, that we've seen other um, defensive ends uh, have, like Frank Clark, Michael Bennett, and so forth, are on the field a little bit more. Um, in 2019, three tackles for loss, five quarterback hits, 10 quarterback hurries, four sacks, three forced fumbles, 27 tackles overall. You'd think, well, that broke out from his rookie campaign. Yeah, he did break out a little bit, but what I'm saying is there's even more room here for him to kind of emerge oh, as yeah. maybe a maybe a uh, nine sack guy given more reps and given his, the fact that Pete Carroll wants to utilize him more in that three tech spot from the inside pass mm -hmm. rushing. Uh, I think he's got an opportunity there to really use some skill, um, his skill set better uh, on the inside. Just like we talked about with Collier, Rasheem Green's a very similar player, but he's got a lot more athletic upside and a yes. little bit more speed around the edge. So that gives him the ability, the team of the ability to, utilize him in a in a much more of a hybrid role they can keep on keep him on the outside bring in other players to play on the inside they can slide him in he can line up way outside um he's a really athletic guy for yeah, his size yeah well that that play where he chased down Ky kyler murray in arizona last year 2019 shows mm -hmm. the promise of green you know like, he swung way inside Right uh, at first, right off the line of scrimmage, and Kyler rolled way out and sprinting out um, to the outside, and Green caught up with him and tackled him. Yep, and Collier is not making that play. He doesn't have the speed. No, that's exactly right. Um, that's the difference. Rasheem Green, when he got drafted, he was um, super athletic, and he used like all this potential. But he was as raw as you can get. He was player. 20 years old when he was drafted. True. That was going to be my next point on this, is that he is two years younger than Collier. <laughs> yes. <right>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's 23 years old this year. Yeah, this will be his 23-year-old season, um, and Collier already played his 23-year-old season. So, um, yeah, it's kind of crazy. But we're, Green is young and athletic and talented and... Um, I am surprised he is this low on your list as a breakout guy. because Well, I forgot, too, how raw that he was coming into the league and how young. I mean, I, I wrote it down. I wrote 23 years old down, but I really didn't think about it. It's like <laughs> uh, he was so raw, and, and the injury really set him back in the, in the preseason. And um, you could really see the potential that he, this guy had last year. He was probably the second-best defensive lineman on the team last year. 
I would Especially say he, in the in the last in the last uh, eight games of the regular season, he had would, eighteen tackles, two sacks, two forced fumbles, four tackles for loss in the last eight games. So obviously, plus Clowney, a sack in the in the playoffs. Obviously, Clowney, would, if you're going to make that list, Clowney is one. You're going to say Green two. I'm going to say uh, Puna Ford two because Puna Ford had a good year. Um, it's not a statistic job in what he does at nose tackle, but he is. Um, he did his job very well. And then I would say green would probably be three. Um, and which will tell you the state of the defensive line last year. The defensive true. line That's was true. pretty bad. Um, but green has, green has this like really top flight potential. Um, like I said, I'm surprised that he was this low on your list. I had him at number well, two. Well, let me, my, let me say this two. then based on the fact that he's number four on my list, that should get you excited about the players. I've got at three, two, one. Fair enough. I'll give you that. <laughs> All right. Who do you have as your your next guy? Um, my next guy is going to be uh, Marquise Blair, safety. Uh, last year was kind of a guy without a job because they they rolled with Tedrick Thompson um, early on and Bradley McDougald. And then they traded for uh, Quentin Diggs, who became the starter at free safety. And, you know, he got, um, Blair got two starts early on. Actually, so Blair's, has, Blair's your number four or your number three? Three. Um, so Blair, Blair is my number one overall player on my see, list. And the reason why he's my number three is opportunity. Because he still has um, digs as a starter ahead of him. And he still has... Bradley McDougal there that he's fighting with playing time for. Um, and so he either has to beat out Bradley McDougal outright, or his role is going to be the, and a big nickel situation, a third safety and waiting mm-hmm. for someone to get hurt. And that makes it okay. hard to have a breakout year when you're just not on the field that much. Well, I think that big nickel opportunity is going to give him additional opportunities. And I think he's going to take some of those away from Bradley McDougal. I think he has the playing flexibility to play in the box. And he also has the long sp- speed to play deep. And he just hasn't had a lot of work to show his coverage skills. And that's where that big nickel opportunity is going to come in handy. He's going to be able to be on the field. That's going to allow him to play both in the box, up close to the line of scrimmage, where I think he's amazing. And then he's also going to be able to drop back and cover uh, linebackers, or not linebackers, uh, tight ends and running backs coming out of the backfield. And I really think that he has an opportunity. I mean, when he was on the field, you could see oh, he's the, dynamic. the, the he's potential, dynamic the oozing out of him. He was just one of those players that you couldn't keep your eye off of on mm-hmm. the field. And, and he, to me, there was a couple of games there, Keith, where I thought he was the best player on the field at, and, at times. And there w- it was really disappointing when. Uh, he he finally got his chance. He went out there. He excelled. He looked really good. And then, you know, guys like Bradley McDougal got healthy yeah. and Blair yeah. went back to the sidelines. And you're like, yeah, no, he had a chance to start in place of McDougal your, in week seven and eight. You got, you and he had your kids. <laughs> he had 17 tackles, 12 solo, one pass breakup and a forced fumble in those two weeks and then played extensively in week nine and had four more tackles. And then uh, McDougal came back and that was the end of Marquise Blair essentially yeah. and that that to me didn't make a lot of sense i mean i understand wanting to you know you have your veterans and your leaders and all of that but blair yes he was young and he's a rookie and all of that last year but the difference in just his potential and his dynamic uh ability was there and that's something that bradley mcdougall doesn't have he's a good player um well at but one he's not, point the he's team not a was dynamic a, player let me ask you this at one point, the team was 11 and three before things kind of fell off a little bit at the end. Mm-hmm. And so the teams uh, went with, uh, I'm talking about uh, team defensive decision making. Um, the team played um, Daryl Taylor, not Daryl Taylor, who's the other guy? Jamar Taylor. Jamar Taylor uh, at, the, um, at, at the corner spot the nickel corner uh, slot uh, uh, spot and in place of Amadi early. And uh, they went with um, Hendricks, Kendricks over a guy like Cody Barton. And even though Cody Barton had more, some snaps, he didn't really 
see the field as much as maybe he, he could have last year. Mm-hmm. And you had Marquise Blair in the same situation, and Ugo Amadi only had 75 snaps throughout the entire year, um, and most of those came in the last three games. Um, do you think our record and the fact that we were pushing kind of for a Super Bowl you know, until late in the year, we were positioned possibly to, to, to take over the NFC West um, right into the last game? Um, do you think that had anything to do with not playing these young guys? I hope that was the decision making and not just Pete Carroll being trying to be loyal to guys and, and play veterans because he doesn't trust young players. Um, that, that didn't used to be <clears throat> the case. I know. Uh, but it has been the case more the last like three years. And last year was a pretty big example of it where the, the, the young dynamic athletes just had a hard time seeing the field for some reason, even when they came in and did well, like Marquise Blair, they went back to the sidelines. Um, and it's not like, yes, the team was, was 11 and three and they looked like a Super Bowl contender and all that, but they were not at that spot because the defense was good. Right. So you have, yes, absolutely. The, the records there, the opportunity is there, but the defense was not good. So, so you me, took your your playmakers like Amadi was a playmaker in college. Marquise Blair was a playmaker and a headhunter in college. You kept and Barton was the, was known as being very aggressive and the, and, the, and a solid tackler in college. And all three of those guys couldn't see the field on a defense that was ranked twenty seventh overall. Yeah, and you had guys that were you know like Michael Kendricks did not play well last yeah, year. Yeah, he had his moments, but that was it. Um he he did not live Poor up, tackler. He did not yeah. live up to his twenty eighteen season, I'll give you that. And then um I mean Jamar Taylor was terrible. Awful. He was just absolutely terrible. Um you had opportunities to upgrade your defense with young dynamic players and they chose to play super conservative in terms of that decision making and keep the veterans for most of the year. Let me ask um, you this. Is Pete Carroll going to make the same mistake this year, not playing Marquise Blair in favor of Bradley McDougald? I hope not. But do you think that Marquise Blair has the potential to be better than Bradley McDougald in 2020? Absolutely. See, now you and I are probably one of the very few people talking about that. Everyone seems to think that Bradley McDougald is this player. Yeah, he's steady. He's got great leadership ability and all that stuff, but he's okay as a player you know he's he's not great Mm -hmm. he doesn't have any sort of flash as far as having an impact on the game making impact plays generating turnovers from that position all that kind of stuff yeah he's going to intercept the ball a couple times maybe he's a better playmaker on the ball than Marquise Blair is today but you got to give Blair an opportunity yeah I think so too even if it's more rotational where you you have McDougald out there for as the starter and whatever, but you make sure that you get Blair snaps in every game at that position, um, because he's just a more dynamic athlete. And I agree. That's can, why he was my number one. I thought that he, if given an opportunity, he could come in and really change the defense. Yeah. And so he was um, he was my number three because of of uh, opportunity. And I I am afraid of Pete Carroll uh, Me too. and, you know, company basically saying, nope, we're going to have you live on the sidelines again. And I that would crush that would crush me because he's too good of a player to have on the sidelines. Wow. So. Awesome. Well, I've only got one more guy to, to talk about. Um, so who's your so other why guy? Don't you, well, why don't you go first? That way I. You've probably got two more guys to talk about. I do. Um, so my next player uh, is someone that we've already mentioned, uh, and that would be Ugo Amadi. Um, is that and your last? And he's my one? last player. He's yep. my la- that's my last player. And so um, Ugo Amadi is uh, was a college safety slash slot corner. Uh, is going to be the nickel corner in this year. Um, he came in, we thought he would be given that opportunity at some point last season, given that uh, there wasn't really any other option. They, they I was brought, shocked. Actually. They brought in Jamar Taylor, and he was terrible. Um, he lasted nine games before they finally gave up on him. But even when they gave up on him, it wasn't uh, Amadi that was getting uh, you know the playing time there. You started to see guys like Akeem King come in and, and, and yep. get 
and, snaps. And more and, linebacker play in, in the base. Mm-hmm. And so you, you just didn't get, um, he never really got a chance until the end and, and in the playoffs. And when he finally got on the field, guess what? He looked really good. He tor- well, he got torched in the playoffs. Well, he did a couple times, but he also in... Adams had eight receptions, 161 yards, and two TDs. In, in the most notable play of the entire playoffs was when Amadi went one-on-one with Devontae Adams on on the game icing play and found Adams for a 32-yard fade. True. Um, no, I'm not saying I'm against Amadi. Amadi's number two on my list. I'm just saying that because Devontae he only Adams got 76 does. snaps on defense in 2019, Amadi wasn't ready for that game. And he uh, wasn't. And Adams, quite frankly, is one of the best route runners in the game. He is. And especially like they, the Packers did a great job of fight, of moving totally uh, things agree. around and getting, making sure that the coverage was what they wanted. So they moved players around and isolated Adams onto Blair, knowing that. <clears throat> it was going to be a struggle, on a, and on the a C- Mahdi. yeah, and they and the the Seahawks didn't didn't adjust that game icing play with that fade. Yeah, um, you need and to you have... and I were talking about Ken Norton Jr. after that game. Like, what is going on with yeah. this, with the scheme? Why is Ken Norton Jr. still a defensive coordinator? Yeah, because that was I mean he that was a poorly schemed game. He got he got out coached as far as like you know putting the game plan together. They had. They were dictating to Seattle everything that they wanted I, to do. I absolutely agree, and I, um, you can't place all of that on Amadi. No, and and so the, you know you're putting him in his first like extensive playing time. You're putting him one on one against one of the best receivers in the NFL, and not giving him safety help. Really, really, that's what you're going to do. Um, but <laughs> yeah. uh, before that game. Um, he played, you know, he did get uh, playing time the week before, did well. Um, I mean, obviously there was something on the tape that the Packers thought they could take advantage of, and they did. But I do think that Amadi, the potential's there, the talent's there. He's absolutely he's such, such a um, such a, uh, a a good player. And this year, it looks like he's finally going to be given the opportunity that he should have been given last year. Um, and that is to be the full-time nickel corner. Yeah. Um, the last two years at Oregon, he had six interceptions, pick uh, three pick sixes, two in one year, mm-hmm. four forced fumbles, um, started the last three games at nickel corner with 55 snaps, had five tackles and an interception, but he hadn't, didn't see any snaps between week three and week 14. Like that was just such the most bizarre. And we talked about the decision making again on which players get to see the field and all that stuff. And this plays right into that. It was the same same deal with Amadi. And I just didn't get it. I mean, knowing and and you and I maybe watch a little bit more Oregon football than some of the other folks um at at the time. And um Amadi clearly is has really nice upside as a is a terrific player. Um, they drafted him what in the third round, fourth round. Um, it is, it's it's just one of those things that's confounding to me. When our defense was so poor last year, <clears throat> that you just don't, not giving these younger guys an opportunity, especially clearly knowing that this guy is probably going to be your starter going forward. Not giving him any opportunity to get better, read defenses, make plays, all that kind of stuff. And Amadi is known as being kind of a playmaker. He's a great ball hawk. He jumps routes. He's, you know, puts himself in a position to like make plays. And hopefully we can see that this year. And that's why he was number two on my list. Well, and, and for me, like the big thing is like with Marquise Blair, you had, you at least had um, Bradley McDougal, who's a good player uh, there. He's not a, he's not an all pro candidate in any way. And he's, you know, maybe borderline pro ball, maybe, but he's at least a good player at the slot corner. You had Jamar Taylor, who was terrible. Inexcusable. Um, and then when Taylor, finally, they finally gave up on him and cut him, they went with Akeem King, who really wasn't that good either. Um, yeah, he and, doesn't have enough agility to play that spot. No, he's, he's too big. He's a, he can a, cover tight ends and that's it. He's a, yeah, he can cover tight ends and he can do that really well. He's more of a, a big nickel, 
uh, in that situation yes. where you, you put him Correct. on you put him on a um, you know a, an elite tight end a guy like Kittle um, Kelsey yeah right right and, and you know Akeem King his name got. Got you know he, we know him from not from last year but from the year before when they beat Kansas City, um, and yes. he sh- he was the guy who shut Kelsey down, um, right? And was but a big you're not going to have win. him shut down a, gil- a little receiver like Edelman or whatever. I mean, he's oh, just no. not. He's that's gonna not going to happen. But Amadi can crushed. play that that yeah. spot. Yeah, and and so anyway. it, it was it was frustrating in that, like I said, with with it was it was more understandable with uh, Blair because you had a good player above him. Um, I think he's a lesser player than Blair, but he's still a good player with Amadi. You had nothing above him as far as talent. And he, they still chose veteran over talent. Um, even though the veteran was bad. Um, and that was really frustrating. So, um, yeah, I think he is poised to be the the biggest breakout player on uh, the defense, um, yeah. with the exception given the of, opportunity, yeah, with the exception of Rasheem Green, who was my number one. So interesting. Um, so count down your five, five, five right. one. Yeah. So I had Cody Barton, Rasheem Green, number four, L.J. Collier, number three, uh, Amadi, number two, and Marquise Blair, number one. And I went with. L.J. Collier. Um, uh, Did we not talk about one of yours yet? No, we haven't. Um, L.J. <laughs> Collier was my four. Um, Ugo Amadi was my two. Oh, so that were, that's what I'm missing. Um, Blair. So it was four was um, Collier. Uh, three was Blair. Two was Amadi. One was Rasheem Green. And we didn't talk about my five because I saved it. Just like last week, because it's the big big surprise here that nobody's talking about. You're going to talk um, about Griffin? No. Oh, you think yes. I was going to talk about I Griffin? Missed. I just swung and missed. I thought I was going to nail you. No. I, I, uh, my my opportunity for a uh, breakout player that nobody is talking about, that I, one I saved, is Trey Flowers, cornerback. Wow. The guy is, he just, he was 24 last year. He was not good. Um, he had three interceptions, 82 tackles. He was third on the team in tackles. Great tackler on the outside. They love him for his ability to, to make those plays. Um, and, you know, college safety, learning cornerback uh, at the pro level, had never played cornerback, looked really good as a rookie, and then struggled last year, um, you know, with making, you know, bad decisions and, and, getting himself caught in um, in situations where, you know, he was coming up when he needed to be dropping back and dropping back. You know what I mean? Like he was thinking too much. Um, yeah. And we saw the same thing happen with Quill Griffin, where he looked really good as a rookie and then had a down year in year two. And then last year looked really good, like real, like he was a pro bowler, um, one of two defensive uh, pro bowlers on the Seahawks last year. Um the other one, of course, being Bobby Wagner, but, and so I kind of, you kind of get that same feeling with Flowers, that he had that, that promising rookie year where you could see all that talent, um, and then he was really, really struggled last year, and, yeah. um, what do you think that that was caused from? Do you think that it's another situation where, um, where he's just been put in a position to not be successful by a little bit scheme? I, I, it's not just, it's not really the scheme. I think the scheme fits him really well. I think part of it has to do with the Tedrick Thompson effect. Um, and so he that. was, he was asking, be, he was being asked or he was asking himself to, um, I can't make mistakes. I can't take chances. I can't, um, you know, I've, I've got to be careful and that's not his game. His game is to be aggressive. Um, and I think it was, it became a mental issue. And then, you know, once you start, you give up a couple deep balls or you're in position to make a play and you miss it, you know, it starts to kind of roll a little bit. And I think that what we saw down the stretch, the last uh, few games is that once Quadre Diggs had a chance to, uh, you know, get in there and get some like 
reps and, and get some playing time, you start to you started to see Flowers play better down the stretch. Um, and I think that the trust of his free safety in the back really had a lot to do with it. Um, and so therefore I, I could see flowers coming in and being really, really good. Uh, I don't know if he's, getting, so he's not going to get a lot role? of playing time. That's the hard part because we know, um, uh, Quentin Dunbar is going to be a starter on one side. Uh, Quill Griffin's going to be the starter on the other side. You've got a Do we know that? Do we, do we know we know that that Quentin Dunbar is going to be the starter or will uh, he be he was a, will he slide inside and play this the, the slot to allow the defense to have a, a three-headed monster well what they might do is you're gonna see I think I, I do think you're gonna see uh, Quentin Dunbar as the starter but when they move to the nickel it might be Dunbar sliding inside to the slot and Trey Flowers coming in on the outside and rolling with that kind of situation. Or even uh, Quill Griffin, who has um, elite uh, ability to cover the smaller, shiftier Julian Edelman types. Maybe he slides inside and, and Flowers comes in on the outside. So that's another option. Of course, now what you're looking at is, is if you do that kind of role, you're taking Ugo Amadi off the field again. Um, yeah, I, st- I still think though that that might present the, the best opportunity to put the best starting, uh, 11 out on the field because, you know, <clears throat> in those situations, uh, a lot of those times when you're, when you're playing the, the nickel in the, in the third uh, corner, you're, you're in the red zone. Mm-hmm. Um, and Trey Flowers is an underrated red zone cornerback, I believe. He's at six three two zero three, he defends really long. It makes yeah, those, he really is and four really four five hard. speed. Yep. So yeah, so he was he was um, yeah, he's he's. I I do believe that he came on last year, and I think you attributing some of the difficulties um, uh, to his play last year were attributed to safety play. Um, and I think having Quentin Dunbar there, uh, also having Diggs there full time will help Trey Flowers um, in ways that I don't know that we can fully anticipate right now. But I'm sure Pete Carroll has run through these scenarios over and over in his head um, and understands exactly how he wants to use these guys. I do think Trey Flowers playing time is going to go down this year. There's there's no question that's going oh, to yeah. limit his snaps. But I think the snaps that he does play could be more effective um, and that might be the key to, to mm-hmm. bringing out everything that you can bring out of Trey flowers as a corner and give him an opportunity, you know, in a, in a contract year for Quentin Dunbar. Um, you know, he is part of the team this year, but it is a contract year. This would give Trey flowers an opportunity to learn um, a little bit more on the job and uh, perform well in a, in an improving defense, especially in the secondary um, and hopefully a, a pass rush that can, uh, the pressure rate goes up. We might not get the sacks, but the pressure rate I think is going to go up, which is going to help Trey Flowers on the back end. This is an opportunity that, you know, you, you're sneaky correct here in bringing out this player as a breakout player opportunity um, where his interception rate could go up, his forced turnovers. They can use Trey Flowers. You know, Trey Flowers had uh, three sacks last year. Um, they could use Trey Flowers more in that role. Uh, to kind of come up and, and blitz. Corner blitz, um, yeah. And so uh, this could turn into kind of a sneaky underrated move um, by you to, to put him <laughs> on this list. Well, and and that's why I saved him is because I figured like, nobody is talking about Trey Flowers. Everyone's like, oh, good, they got Dunbar. Dunbar is the, the biggest upgrade they made uh, on the defense, and he's going to have the biggest impact of all of the changes and all of this. And so people are basically like just, Trey Flowers doesn't exist. Um, but I, I don't, I see him having an opportunity to, uh, really come into his own as a better player. Now he'll have less snaps, which means he'll probably have less tackles. That's a great way to put it. And, and less, you know, um, you know, he'll have less stats, but he will be a significantly better player and therefore have a, uh, a bigger positive impact than he had last year. And that's why I included him. And it's also why I saved him here to the end because 
I, I thought he would be more controversial than you're, you're agreeing with me too much. <laughs> well, it, it is controversial, but I can see it. I, I can, I see the logic of your, um, of your controversy. Yeah. Okay. So we're not quite done though. Um, we're not at the end of the complete end of the list. We're end of the, uh, of the veteran guys, but we've got a couple of rookies, um, to talk about. These are players that we, um, think, uh, will have an impact on the, on the year, um, and could definitely be quote unquote rookie b- breakout guys. Mm-hmm. Um, go, go first. Uh, we probably have the two same, same guys. So, <clears throat> well, the most obvious one to me is, um, you know, is Taylor up front uh, at defensive yeah. end. He's almost certainly going to be the starter at the Leo side, the seven tech, um, and has all of the athleticism and potential to uh, come in and do what Cliff Haverhill used to do, what they wanted Ezekiel Elliott to do last year, and he couldn't, um, and, and just be that guy. He's just got all the talent, and he's going to be given the opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. This pick, uh, last year and last year's draft, instead of Collier in the first round would actually make more sense. You know, it's, this is the kind of guy that you're looking for to make an impact on Mm -hmm. your defense. Um, Collier's a, you know, could, could end up being a steady, uh, rotation guy for you for a long time. And that first round pick, you know, um, hanging over his head may or may not work out. Uh, a guy like Daryl Taylor, though, just oozes off the tape as far as the athleticism, the explosive first step. Like I watched uh, about eight minutes of tape on him uh, yesterday in preparation for the show. And that explosive first step and that hand punch and that um, the discipline he had as a run defender and being able to have the agility to navigate through traffic and jump over players to make tackles and so forth is just evident on the field, you know, his, his worst trait is, is kind of a counter move. You know, he doesn't have a lot of built in counters, but he's coming to an NFL team where he's going to get the best coaching in the world, plus players, um, to, to be able to, to help him with that and teach him that. But you can't teach some of the things that he brings to the table, just the excellent athleticism and the elite bend and short area quickness that he has is, is top level. So if that all comes together for him and you're right, he's going to get starter minutes, starter reps, uh, at that position by the second half of the year, this guy could end up being a monster. Now, a lot of times rookies in this situation, um, have a difficult time and you know, most guys are going to have under 10 sacks in their rookie year um, at this position, at this kind of role. Um, So it definitely wouldn't shock me that he comes in and end up having six or seven sacks, and that's still going to have a a large impact on the defense. Um, So it's not likely that he's going to get 10 sacks or 12 sacks or whatever, but the potential is there for him to have a pretty sizable impact on the defense. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you, the other one I think is is just as obvious, so go for just it. Just as obvious, Jordan Brooks. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, he's he's going to take snaps at, at Sam, at the Will. Um, 6'1", 245, Texas Tech, 127 overall in the 2020 draft. I think he's going to end up take, being the, 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 the Will of this team in the future. Um, and he's just a big, physical, rangy, elite speed linebacker who loves to hit and has this urgency with the sideline to sideline thing and better than advertised in coverage as a tone setter. He can be used as a spy. This is one of the best things I love about him is he can be used as a spy against players like Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson um, and a, an effective blitzer uh, when we, we decide to use him that way. Um, we didn't have any answers for players like Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson last year on the team. Um, you know, when you when you lost a step a little bit when when Kendricks was out, uh, which he would would normally take that role a little bit uh, when he was injured. Cody Barton just really wasn't you know quite that that sort of player. KJ Wright had lost a step a little bit. Even Bobby Wagner was a little slow chasing down uh, plays. Mm-hmm. Um, a guy like. Jordan Brooks restores that athleticism and speed at that position. And um, I'm excited about Jordan Brooks. I mean, the more I look at, at this pick, I think this guy's going to be a fixture um, in, in team speed and aggressiveness on the defense for years to come. 
So the, the only the only thing that I would dispute out of everything that you said is I don't believe he is the future at will. I believe he's the future at the middle linebacker spot. Um, he may at, get some at the where at middle middle linebacker. Um, that I don't even want to say it out loud though. So when because you know Bobby Bobby <laughs> Wagner's not going to play forever, and they yeah, he is and yeah, they he is. and um, Jordan Brooks is a guy that will. Uh, be the Sam this year. He may be uh, the Will linebacker for a couple of years um, while we wait for that inevitable retirement by Bobby Mm -hmm. Wagner. But Jordan Brooks is the future at middle linebacker. And he has all of the Bobby Wagner traits. He's big. I don't know. I think by the time you get... It's hard. I I think by the time you get two, three years down the road and uh, Jordan Brooks has proven how really good he is at the Will... um, that the team comes up with another solution at, at the middle linebacker eventually because Jordan Brooks is going to show that he's so valuable off the ball that I, 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 I. yeah, he's just, <laughs> he's, he's really good. I think he's going to be better in coverage too than advertised. I mean, last year didn't get a lot of reps. I think that's the hang on him from a lot of pundits and stuff. But mm-hmm. you go back to his junior, so, um, sophomore and junior years, you know, he did plenty of that and did really it well. And good. he has a, yeah. athletic traits in order to be able to do that really well. So, um, yeah, we'll see. And if they do play him in the middle, dude, I'm, I have no problem with that. He's got the same sort of demeanor and speed that Bobby Wagner had as a rookie. Yep. Um, there's, so we're t- looking at, at one of the things when, when we were going into the draft, you and I were both like, they're going to focus on the defense. Right. And they did the first two picks were linebacker and defensive end. they focused on, and then they only had one more defensive pick the rest of the draft, um, came away with, um, you know, all the seven players, Alton no, eight, eight players, um, total, but it went three defense, five offense. Alton Robinson is the only other defensive player. And he is a dark horse as a breakout yeah, player sure. because this is a guy with, um, you know, Daryl Taylor type ability, just such an elite, elite first step, like even Michael, more twitch than Daryl Taylor. Yeah. Just, you know, for him, he fell in the fifth round cause still there's some, serious question marks about decision making off the field and uh that kind of stuff going on but as far as just athlete on the field this guy has the potential to be amazing and um we'll see if he can get on the field enough to actually show that this year uh but you want to talk about a twitched up guy with a ton of, of potential to just be disruptive by by having that first step and getting behind a um an offensive tackle you know early in the in the in the down um i mean alden robinson has a chance to be great so yeah yeah no absolutely um you know this this guy's a, an excellent player um four star recruit coming out of college or or high school 63 257 he's got the perfect leo kind of size uh weight combo um elite explosiveness and, and length um you know and he explodes off the ball and so a guy like that anytime you you have opportunities with a guy like that especially if he's only going to play like 10 15 snaps a game all those snaps are going to be in a pass rushing situation mm-hmm. where all he's being asked to do is to go forward He's not asked, to, you know, in those situations to drop back into coverage or whatever. He's just focusing on one job, and that's to get to the quarterback. Anytime you have a guy like that on the field, um, you know, he's going to have opportunities to to make an impact. I mean, a guy like that, even in a small role, could end up with five sacks. Oh, absolutely. And so then you end up with um, with Taylor as you know the starter at the Leo and that, and his primary backup. Uh, being Robinson, like you've got that that spot on the field is going to be nailed down by rookies. Well, and, and Mayoa, that I mean, to me is kind of you know, crazy, but at the same Mayoa time, could have a, actually a, a really interesting so much upside in this. A lot of potential. Yeah, I mean that that I feel better. You know, the more we go on, the more we talk about the off season, the more we talk about these players and the capabilities. I think it's an underrated off season put together by John Schneider and Pete Carroll. Um, I know that everyone was focused on Clowney, but when you spread Clowney's 
cap out over a number of different players, plus add high impact rookies to the equation, you end up with a better overall defense. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's what's happened at, at this juncture in the off season. It's only you know conjecture right now. It's on paper. But I think we're a better defense. We have a better back end. We have a better linebacker core. We have a better front end overall depth wise. And we've talked about that a little bit um, as far as the, the depth. But I think this team needs that depth. We needed that depth. Last year we didn't have it. It showed in the fact that our defense was poor overall. Clowney is only one player. Yes, he does impact other players because he takes on double teams and, and so forth. And he is a dynamic player at times, but at other times he wasn't. And at other times he was injured and off the field completely. And this allows us, I think, to be better overall. And and we need to do that in order to be competitive enough to, to get further into the playoffs. Yeah. And what you were saying with them spreading it out. So you take, you take out Clowney <clears throat> out of the defense, but you add in Irvin and Mayoa and Taylor and Robinson and Brooks and yes. Dunbar. Right? right. So they've, they've taken out this, the one awesome, amazing, you know, player, but then they've added in all this other talent. Plus um, digs for more than four games or five games or whatever he played. Yeah, and so what you have when you do all of that is you you upgrade the defense overall, even though you lost that elite player, and they're still not out of the running to get Clowney back. And the longer, and or a, a, and or another stout defensive tackle. Yeah, and so the the longer this plays out with Clowney, the more likely he is to come back. Um, I think. Because I agree. his options continue to get limited, and he's not going to sit the year out. Uh, he's going to go make some money, um, even if it's only ten or twelve million dollars from Seattle. It's not the twenty four he wanted, but it's better than zero if he sits the year out. Um, and so I think he'll come back, and then, but perhaps they don't, because instead of doing that, they go get a defensive tackle, which they need another defensive tackle. Because right now you've got your starters, and then your only real backup is Brian Monet and a guy who was an undrafted free agent a year ago and a 360 yeah. pound run stuffer. Yeah. The more I think about guys like Collier and green sliding into the three tech, I think we'd be best served getting a mammoth run stuffer guy. Mm-hmm. Um, if they can find a run stuffing guy that can come in and rotate with Puna Ford, um, that would please me to no end because first and foremost, a P Carroll defense wants to stop the run. And right now, I think that we're a middling run stopping defense. And I think if we could add that, um, add that piece, add that woods piece that we had last year, that could possibly make this defense into a, a, a you know, a, a top 15 defense. I'm not going to go all the way from, you know, mid twenties to top 10, but if we can get closer to 15 with our offense that we've talked about recently, uh, this team could potentially be an NFC championship game kind of team mm-hmm. i'm Absolutely. not saying they could go to the super bowl and win it <clears throat> but i'm saying they could be there they could be the you know a top four top six team in the nfl yeah i mean they could this is a team that uh appears to be poised to take that next step so in the last couple of years they've gotten bounced in the divisional round the next step would be to the conference game and once you get there you know we'll see because who are they going to be playing in that game? Uh, San Francisco, maybe. I, I like Seattle over over them because of the quarterback. Uh, you know, there you can yeah. maybe Green Bay, maybe um, New Orleans, the Saints. Yeah, and so there there are there. You then you start looking at matchups and you go, oh, well, maybe they could. You know, they they may not be on paper the best team in the NFC, but you get there. And it just happens to be that it ma- it's a good matchup, right? Um, one team versus the other, that's, and so that's right. they end up they end up getting getting in, and so then it's it's like okay, what are you going to do against Kansas City uh, in the Super Bowl? Um, and that's and gonna... now they have a spy in Jordan Brooks, mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, for the yep. for the new richest <laughs> uh, NFL player. So yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of you're not going to hear a 
outside of this conversation, you're not going to hear a lot of people talk about the Seahawks in that sort of conversation this year. You're going to uh, you're going to hear a lot about Seattle uh, diminishing. Um, you're going to hear a lot about the Cardinals this year. You're going to hear a lot about the the 49ers coming back and um, being the same team uh, with with a couple of additional players this year. Um, and I think that Seattle could come uh, and wreck some wreck some teams this year um, and, and wreck some plans and be there at the end to compete for the NFC West um, title game, just like they were last year. Mm-hmm. And um, if they can eke out, if they can win one more game this year, if they can get to 12 wins, I think that really does give them an opportunity to take the division and put themselves in a position to have home field advantage. You know, if they can get to 13, I think they've got home field advantage. They've got oh, absolutely, an absolutely. opportunity to a real window to get to the Super Bowl. You know, it's hard to win 13 games. You can't predict that right now. But um, I think they can get to 12. And if they can, they have a real opportunity to, to at least get there and, and get to the dance. Yeah, and, and to me, you look at, you know, there's, people are all, you know, there's a, nationally everyone is kind of all in on San Francisco. Uh, and... I, I understand it because they were at the Super Bowl team last year, but they were about six inches away from not winning the division, not having home field, not having uh, that first round by. And that six inches, you know, came against Seattle. If Seattle gets those extra, um, those extra inches needed to get into the end zone at the end of that game, it's Seattle with the first round by and um, all of that. So it's, it's uh, it, it, you know, they were much much closer um, than I think people want to admit. Well, this is a nice little segue into next week's show, um, where we actually have a deeper conversation about this, mm-hmm. uh, where we talk about the best and worst case uh, win loss scenarios or season scenarios for twenty twenty. Uh, what what's the best case? And we're also going to talk about the worst case. Like, what if the wheels fall off? What if Russell Wilson has an injury? What if we have a slow start? All that kind of stuff kind of comes into play. Um, where where do we see us f- uh, finishing if, if everything goes wrong? Where do we see us finishing if everything goes right? And so that'll be a fun episode. Uh, in two weeks, we have special guest Dana O'Gorman joining us on the show. I think for the third appearance, the third time she's been on the show uh, mm-hmm. in the last four years. And we're going to just take a look around the NFL with Dana. We're going to talk about Seahawks, obviously, and we're going to talk about everything else, how it comes together uh, in the final week of podcasting before the training camp episode where we actually get to talk about players and what we see on the field and all that stuff. And it's going to be wild and crazy. We're only three weeks away, Keith, and it seems like two years away from the Mm -hmm. training camp. I mean, we have nothing in the off season, no uh, workouts that we can talk about, no uh, rookie camp, no anything. So everything is going to be so fresh and new and players seeing the field together for the first time in months. I can't, it's hard for me to even imagine what it's going to look like. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited for, to talk about, you know, what we're seeing as far as, you know, watching players and not, you know, and I love our off season shows, but there's just something way more fun about watching players play and uh, getting a chance to talk about what we're seeing. All right. So we're going to wrap this thing up and we're going to come back next week. So until uh, next time, Keith, um, you can find Mr. Myers on Twitter at Myers NFL. I'm at NW Seahawk. The show is at Hawks Playbook, Hawks Playbook, SeahawksPlaybook.com has all of the shows. You can subscribe there. Um, you can subscribe on your favorite podcast app. We don't want to have you miss any shows. And we recently just added a YouTube channel. Right now we're just kind of uh, flowing through some, um, some, some images in the background while our audio plays. Uh, eventually, maybe, if you twist our arms hard enough, we might actually uh, record our Zoom conference calls and you can you can see us talk uh on the show um on the youtube channel so until next time go hawks go hawks seahawks playbook podcast listeners thanks for joining us for another edition of the show you can find us on twitter bill is at nw seahawk keith is at myers nfl the show is at hawks playbook and you can listen and subscribe to the show at seahawksplaybook.com